I think we were having uh, a little bit of technical difficulties because we went from um, from zero to all of a sudden seven people. <laughs> so that is always really, really exciting. Welcome, welcome everybody uh, for coming to this one. If you saw us on Business Link, um, this one was actually presented to Business Link for the very first time uh, two, two weeks ago. Uh, we'll be doing our second of the series tomorrow with them. So if you are interested in either uh, watching it again for the second time around, maybe this is your first time around or getting in front of um yeah okay no worries hello brenda <laughs> yeah um or if you're looking to get the second part tomorrow before we present it um that will be a great opportunity to um to be able to to get out this all right so we're gonna have people slowly slowly joining us um which is absolutely wonderful and i see a lot of people have already done their housekeeping keeping their video off and their mute off we will have time for a few questions at the very very end so feel free to um to be able to to have that conversation with us as we go forward um i am just taking a quick look uh, looks like my my uh, my background is not uh, not playing very nicely with me today, so please provide a little bit of patience with that. All right, so do do do. Let's get started. Okay, so this is a four part series. If you have been a part of us for a little while, um, this is actually our second of four part series. Uh, if you have not seen our, our first four part series, that one was released about two years ago, maybe close to three years ago now. And that one was really about getting the business started. We covered topics such as the business building pyramid. We talked about, you know, how, how to understand better who your ideal client is and ultimately get yourself to a place where you know how to price yourself appropriately um, very valuable content i highly uh, recommend that you take a look at that if you are looking for that uh, Nizi is on the chat here today just send her a quick message or even just to everybody um, you can just say hey i would love to be a part of that four-part series and we'll send you the recordings and the series as it is but specifically why this series why did we decide it was upon us to recreate something that was already working really well well as we went through this what we came to the understanding was that the economy has really allowed more people to introduce themselves into entrepreneurship better than ever and more than ever before but the one thing i will say about that is that it is a fallacy it is a fallacy that it takes two years to become profitable because there's plenty of examples and companies out there that become profitable right away. And it wasn't until after I had the epiphany moments with my own business, I was like, oh, I was doing it all wrong. And so I wanted to create this series because the moment I got it right, which is exactly what we're going to go through in the next four series, um, you're going to be able to build your business up a lot faster, ultimately to the, the, the place where you are generating revenue within the first 30 days. Now, granted, we're not going to be running each one of these series week over week over week. It is We are going to be spacing them out a couple weeks apart and you're going to see, you know, we're going to get really close to Christmas. But if you are determined, absolutely determined to be profitable, generating a lot of revenue, having those high end clients, I promise you, you're going to get there if you follow along. Because the one thing that I truly believe is that every business owner deserves to have premium clients willing to pay a premium price. I work with a lot of entrepreneurs and they typically say, there's one gentleman that I'm thinking of in particular, and I said, where do you want to be positioned, right? There's the price service quality triangle. You can have any two, but you can't have all three. And he says, well, for now, we're going to position ourselves to be really like the lowest price and really good quality, but we're not going to be, you know, too, too fast with the service, right? We just, we want to get, get it out there. We want to get it cheap. And then later on, what we'll do is we'll change it to be that we're really good service and really good um, quality, but we don't, we, we then charge a higher pr price. And I said, the problem with that, I said, is that McDonald's tried this? Walmart tried this. When you set your company up, you can't go ahead and completely shift your business model and assume that your clients are going to follow you. When McDonald's decided to offer, you know, gourmet burgers, 
they ended up running the test pilot for three months and then shut it down because nobody goes to McDonald's for a gourmet burger. Walmart used to have their premium subscription model. Nobody used it. They shut it down because nobody goes to Walmart for a premium subscription model. Whereas if they would have set their business up, that's how they would have been positioned. So right from day one, I am telling you, you deserve to have clients who are willing to pay you top dollar. It's about being able to communicate that and being able to help move that forward. And then the next three sessions, we are going to get further into how you're going to get there. But I truly believe that every company deserves this. Who is this program really for? So this is really for those companies that have either started a business in the last 12 months or are planning on starting in the next three months, but they really haven't generated any money. That said, we have seen incredible value with people that have had their businesses for two, three, five years. They're, those are the ones that are <sighs> running in the treadmill nonstop. They're running, they're running, they're running, and they feel exhausted. And they say, something needs to change. So now it's time to bing, hit that reset button and we're going to get you right back to business 101 and how to generate those premium clients. This is also those that are serious about making a profit. We are specialized in high value business to business service based conversation. So typically our clients are the ones who are like, I am a consultant. They are trying to sell something that is invisible for a top dollar. You can use this if you're talking about products or you're talking about other types of services, but really what we're looking for is those that are really trying to sell something for nothing. What we're gonna cover over the next four part series. So you'll have to follow us along on our LinkedIn page. If you're not a current subscriber, definitely subscribe. But the fact that you're on this webinar already tells me that you're subscribed to our email list. So you are going to get updates when, the, when part two, part three, part four come out. But I did let you know that tomorrow we're gonna to be hosting part two with Business Link as a partnership. So you can go ahead and already skip to the front of the line by getting your part two in tomorrow. So this is today we're going to be covering how to start when you don't know what to sell. Number two, we're going to be getting into your first clients through genuine curiosity without being salesy. So we're going to go immediately from how to figure out what it is that you sell or how to start those conversations um, tomorrow or in a couple of weeks time, whichever one works for you, we're going to go through how do we connect with that client right away. I'm going to give you the magic formula for emails that gets you meetings. Number three, now we're now that the prospect has agreed to the meeting, how do you have a really effective meeting? Um, spoiler alert, this does not mean that you have to prepare a deck or a brochure or have some other type of crutch that you're presenting to your clients. That's actually the best way of never getting that client again. And then number four, once you've had that meeting, hopefully you're either at that point, you might have a couple more meetings, you might stay in, in number three for a little while, but hopefully you're at that point where now you're ready to present that solution. Now you're ready to present something. And when you are, how do you then go ahead and price this? I want you to play with me on this because the reality is, is you do not have to have your product service or price figured out before you get to number four, we're going to learn how to be able to develop that value ahead of time. And trust me, it is going to be more valuable for your client because they're going to see you as a collaborative partner. And that in their minds is worth a premium. So my promise to you throughout this entire series is that if you follow along, yeah, Brenda's already signed up. That's fantastic, Brenda. If you follow along with this series and the other three series, I promise you, you do exactly what I tell you to. You do your homework. You do the work. Um, you will get to the results that you want. Now, I also promise you that if you have any questions, if you're not sure if you're going down the right approach, you have us, me and my team, we have Mike on the line, we have Neezy on the line, we have me on the line, 
we are here for you and we will help you get to where you want to go to. Because that mountain is a lot easier when you have a guide, a Sherpa working with you and helping to carry the load than if you had to go it alone without a complete roadmap. We're going to give you the roadmap, but if you don't know where the stopping points are throughout that path, it may be a little bit more difficult. You'll get there, you'll get there eventually, we're going to help to get you there faster. So no matter what, I promise you, you are going to get to the results as long as you follow this. The question you're going to have to ask yourself is, do I go alone or do I go there with someone else, right? If you want to go there fast, you go alone. If you want to go far, you go together. So let's talk about how do we get started. So if you haven't seen the Simon Sinek TED Talk, he, um, is this he has a couple of TED Talks, but I'm specifically thinking of the start with why, right? He, he's, he goes on and it's a wonderful TED Talk, 18 minutes. I promise you will be more inspired. And not only that, but you will be like ready to buy an Apple computer because he goes into like, why? Why do we exist? And so, you know, his big thing is like, if you start with the why, then you can eventually get to the what. And he uses two different examples. He uses examples of Microsoft and he uses examples of Apple. Apple started with the why, right? Where they say, you know, why do we really want this? Whereas Microsoft started with the what? Microsoft said, we sell computers, we sell operating systems. Awesome, right? How do we do this? Well, we put a bunch of stuff together. Why do we do this? Because people want faster technology. Well, that is great. Whereas Apple started with the bottom and then grew themselves to the what? They said, why do we exist? Because people want to feel creative. They want to feel like anything is possible. How do we do that? We do that, like, how do we do that? We do that by providing people the tools that they need so that when they're creating, they feel the, the, the uh, ability to pass through, through the technology. And what do we do? We provide the sexiest computers known to man. And so when we started with the why, we eventually got there. Now, for a lot of us, the why is going to take a while to get there. We might know our why-ish, right? Why do I want to start my own company? Because I want to help people. Well, great, right? Everybody from the um, bodega down the street selling coffee all the way to Mother Teresa, they all wanted to help people. Does that mean that we're all in the same bundle? Or are we actually helping someone very specific? So the way I want you to change this is to start, change that how, not how do you do this, but who, who do you do this for? By understanding the who first, and we'll talk about examples of companies that use the who first, then they crossed over to the why, and then to the what. Because it, by focusing too much on the what, it doesn't allow us to be fluid business owners and fluidity and pivot. Pivot is the biggest word of the year, right? It's there, there's new normal and pivot, right? How is your business going to pivot? The problem with focusing too much on the what is the perfect example was 2020. Those companies that were so focused on the what did not pivot. Whereas if, whereas if you are focused on the who, who do you serve? Why do you need to serve them? The what will evolve. And we'll learn about the evolution of the what, which is really where I want you to be. I want you to get into this mindset because it is a skill set that will value you throughout the entire life of your business. Being focused too much on the what will end up restricting you and you'll feel like you're stuck in the, in the handcuffs. So let's use some examples of companies that did this really well first. And then from there, we'll be able to determine how this will apply to your business. So I put up a whole bunch of companies on here. And these are big companies when we think about them. We have Airbnb, the Facebook. That's actually the original Facebook's uh, logo. We'll talk about why I chose to use that one as opposed to one of the current ones. FUBU, so if you've ever watched um, Shark Tank, uh, Damon Johns is one of the sharks in there. We'll talk about Whole Foods, who was um, later on bought by Amazon. And Square, Square, a great Canadian company who ultimately is you know, making huge, huge uh, innovations and disruptions in the payment processor space. So let's start with Airbnb. 
when Airbnb first started, right? And I want you to go from the, we're going to talk a lot about how these companies first started, because oftentimes we think that Airbnb really does anything for anyone, right? Who they are. Well, they work with anyone who's looking for a hotel space. The reality is Airbnb eventually got there, but you're not at Airbnb's size. Right now you are at where they started from when it was two guys in an apartment and a website. Like that is where we're going to start. That is what we're going to learn from these companies so that you can help get yourself to the sizes of Airbnb if that's what you want. When Airbnb first, first started, they focused on a very specific who a very small market segment. And this was attendees for conferences who were willing to sleep on air mattresses in order to go. Airbnb would see these cities, the hotels would invent, like if you are having a conference in a city like Boston, yes, the conference ticket might've been fairly cheap, right? It might be an investment, but it's also relatively cheap. You might be paying 300, 400, $500 for a two day, three day conference ticket. Awesome, we can afford that. But what a lot of conference goers were not anticipating was that these hotel rooms would book out so incredibly fast. And not only that, if you were lucky to get a hotel room, oftentimes you were having to pay $400 or $500 a night to be able to go to that same conference. And now your $500 conference ticket was now worth a $3,000 investment because you had to spend three nights at $500 plus food, accommodations and travel. And for most people, they're like, well, I'd love to go to the conference, but honestly, I don't have $3,000 to spend right now. So Airbnb said, well, listen, if you could sleep on the air mattress of somebody's apartment, of condo, would that help you to attend that conference? And they said, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. So why did they do this, right? Well, they did this because the hotel rooms were, were overpriced and were limited to supply. They focused on this really small segment of, of, of people because this was what the problem they were having. What was that? What was the ultimate solution? Was that eventually they got to a place where it was rooms or entire places that you could rent as an alternative. Airbnb is exactly that. It was an Airbnb. It was an air mattress that was like converted into like kind of a bread and breakfast. You were there, you were gone, and then you were on your way. But they ended up growing. If they were so focused on just the rooms or the entire places, they would have never got the following that they eventually did to become the company that they are. Let's talk about Facebook. Okay, so who did Facebook originally target? The first place that they actually target was specifically Harvard students who wanted to meet, and let's be honest, right? We got a bunch of college students, right? I, I wanna mingle, I wanna date with people. And if you're on a Harvard campus, it's really hard to meet other people because there's 60,000 plus people just walking on a campus at any single day. How do you meet another college student unless they happen to be in the same class as you? But if you're in business school, you can't necessarily meet somebody who's in engineering because you're on completely different segments of the campus. So they started by just narrowing themselves down to just Harvard students. It's easy for us to advertise. It's easy for us to spread the message. And we're just going to use word of mouth. We don't need to go word of mouth everywhere, even though we're an online platform. We're just going to stay right here. And eventually when they did decide to grow, it was specifically to only other colleges and university students. When I joined Facebook, I had to prove that I was a college student, a university student, because I had to select university of Alberta from the list of approved colleges or universities. Why did they want to just start there? Because if you wanted to meet someone specifically on campus, there was no way of doing that. They focus on a very small segment of people. They focus on the why they wanted to have that conversation and eventually created the what. The what being an online gathering place. As they continue to grow, then they started to move their network out. And now we have something like, I think it's like one in four people in the world have a Facebook account or something. So I, they didn't start by saying, you know what, we, we want to be the main online platform for anybody who wants to meet online. Right. We want to be the place that you share your photos with your grandma on. That's not how they started. They started very small. They re really focused on the online connectivity with it and then eventually built what it was. Boo-boo. Okay. 
Fubu originally started because um, Damon John said that he loved the idea of having fashion really reflect his love for hip hop music. And when he would watch some of the, the music videos and everything, oftentimes a lot of these hip hop stars were wearing Timberland, Timberland boots. And Timberland boots um, went ahead and said, we do not want to be associated with this culture, right? We do not believe that Timberland is a brand that is representing um, the hip hop culture. We are meant for the outdoors person. And so uh, Damon Johns went ahead and said, well, we need to create something. So what did he start off with? He actually started off with beanies, with toques, with hats. And he actually, he, he created these little beanies, um, these hats, these toques, whatever you want to call them. And he would sat outside of a grocery store and be able to like, you know, kind of peddle these things. Like, hey, do you want this? Do you want this? Because why it was really important for him was that he loved the idea that if you were wearing one of these hats, people knew that you liked the same music. It created an instant rapport connection. It started with a hat, but it was really meant for people who want to showcase their love for hip hop music. By cons constantly coming back to your love for hip hop music is reflected in the clothing that you wear, he eventually created one of the biggest brands in fashion industry today. But what he created was something much smaller, was creating hats that showcase the love. If he would have started off by saying, I create hats for people, everyone would be like, well, why? There's so many other hat companies out there. You're such a small player. But he focused on not just hats, but hats for a specific group of people who wanted to, to help to showcase who they were. Whole Foods. Okay. Whole Foods really started themselves off by catering to a very small segment of people. This wasn't anybody who wanted to shop at a grocery store, but rather the, the, those that were in much more affluence, people that um, had, you know, could didn't have to budget on their grocery bill. And part of the reason why was because they were focused more so on organics, on naturals, on, on the idea of not having, you know, nearly as much um, materials, right? They, they wanted to feel like they were part of like the farm, right? All the time. They cared more about their health than their grocery bill, which in itself is already a very small segment of people. If you go to your local grocery store that is not Whole Foods, typically the organic section is one aisle, right? You maybe have one aisle. Maybe if you're lucky, there's two. And then there's a little small section of produce that is also organic. And, and Whole Foods says, that's not enough for somebody. Like, if I want to just shop entirely organic, I want my whole store to be organic. And so they really, they carved out that small segment of people that were just shopping in these two little aisles and said, we are going to create a solution just for you. Because oftentimes those, those um, uh, food stores have a very small selection. What did they end up creating? At that point, then they ended up creating high end organic prepared meals. Focusing just on these people, they said, what more do you want? They weren't originally going for high end prepared meals. Just later on, it naturally evolved that they got to that place of high end organic meals. Now to this day, Amazon bought them out and they're part of the Amazon family. Okay, this last example I have for you, Square. Okay. Square started um, to exist because they were looking for the, also a very small segment of companies. They were looking specifically for the small restaurants and retailers that needed to process a credit card. Now, if you are if you are starting a brand new restaurant or a brand new retail outlet, maybe even a pop up, oftentimes you were unable to get a credit card processing uh, machine because oftentimes those credit card processors require you to provide information. That usually what they want is they want uh, months of uh, minimum months of banking information. They want to see how much are you currently processing on your current processor so that they can then go ahead and create you a rate statement and give you all this other material. Now, if you can already see what the problem is here is that if I'm a brand new restaurant, I don't have months of transaction history, right? I'm brand new. I don't have that. And so now I'm getting caught up in this circular reference, right? Well, I don't have it and I can't get it because I don't have it and I don't have it because I can't get it. And so I don't, I don't have it. If you are a brand new restaurant or a retailer and you don't take any type of credit card, the chances of you really getting to a point where you grow is 
almost zero. So what Square said is like, we're not going to require you to have that. The only thing we want you to do is say, yes, you're going to use us and give us your bank account so we can deposit your funds. And that is it. We're going to make it as easy as possible. And we're not even going to provide you the point of uh, point of sale systems. Usually what those are are those pin pads that are required. We'll just give you an app that you can use either on your phone or on an iPad. And that is as easy as possible. So what they ended up creating was eventually e e easy payment processing. But if they didn't focus on specifically the who first, say we provide easy payment processing systems would end up getting them lost in the noise of the crowd because ultimately if i don't know who you're specifically speaking to having that conversation doesn't resonate with me there's too many options for payment processors why would i want to use you as a little startup they said no we specialize with you and why this is really important is this so this is what we can provide who you are why you need us what you'll eventually get with using us. So the point of all of this is I want you to get clear on who you want to serve. If you are so far off, if you're if your ideal buyer, it's sometimes known as a buyer persona, the customer avatar, um, sometimes the ideal client profile, if it is really vague or very broad, you're going to have a hard time focusing your message. So what I really want you to get down to is narrowing it down, shave it down, shave it down, shave it down, shave it down to the point where you can ultimately create a list of 100, 100 ideal clients. These are the people that will ultimately use my services. You're going to use demographics. And, and so um, after we did the business link one, I had between Mike and I, we had a lot of different meetings um, with different people. And some people were very clear on who their ideal market was. And some people were still really vague. Well, I serve women between the ages of 18 to 78 who want to have a better life. Oh, well, you just spoke about, you know, 51% of the entire world, right? I don't know a single woman who's like, I'm good. I don't really want to have a better life, right? Like I'm, I'm okay there. Um, and it turns out that the uh, is 51% of the world is female, not exactly 50. So it's an interesting fact. But what do they want most in the world? And you really want to get that narrowed down. So the way that we're going to look at this is our, like, how do we create our little lobster trap? So, and there's two pictures here, right? There is, there's picture number one where they're trying to just, they're fishing to catch right? I will catch anything. And there's another picture. What that picture is, is actually a lobster trap. And what happens is, is uh, specifically on the East Coast, they'll drop these little traps down at the bottom of the ocean. And the lobster will go in and he's like, oh, this looks interesting. And he'll take a little walk and then he walks right into the trap and then he's stuck. Ah. Ah, I can't get out of there. And then the fishermen come back, you know, two days later and they come and boom, 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 pull up all the traps and they get exactly lobster, nothing else, just lobster. Whereas the people on the left here, they're just going to fish for anything. So they're throwing out these giant ocean nets and they're like, we really don't care what we get. We hope we get something. And they're going to put those nets in and then eventually they're going to try to pull them out. They're going to use all of the strength, pull it, pull it, pull it. And what are they going to get? They're going to get probably some fish that are too small to be able to do anything with that. So they have to throw them back. They might get some fish that nobody really even buys. They, they're a good size, but nobody's going to buy them or they're not valuable in the market. So they're probably they're going to make one of two options. They're going to throw it back or they're like, well, we've done it. So we might as well sell it now, even though we're only going to get that amount of money. They're unfortunately going to get probably some garbage. It's probably some waste, um, seaweed, all sorts of different things. They spent a ton of effort and maybe at the end of it, they caught, you know, two, three, five fish that they could ultimately sell. And they'll do that all over again. And I want you to be honest with yourself. When you are going out there and fishing for your client, are you so clear who your ideal client is, that it is a lobster trap, or are you putting out an ocean net? Because most people that are throwing out the ocean net only really have two criteria for their ideal client. Do they have a pulse? Yep. Do they have a credit card that actually works? Yep. 
And as long as they have two, those two criteria, that's the ideal client for me. That's the people that are fishing for, for anything. They're saying, does the fish actually fish? Like, is it something that I could sell? Probably. Could I sell it for a lot? Yeah, it doesn't matter. I'll sell it for something. Whereas the lobster fishermen are saying, no, we only want the top price fish that you could possibly get. If lobster is the top, that is the only thing we want to catch. We only want to catch the premium. In our company, we do this too. We actually review this annually. And I recommend that you do this annually as well. Because as we, we evolve and as we change our products and our service offerings, we go through and we ask ourselves, how do we make our market even narrower? How do we make it even narrower, right? Not expand it necessarily. Maybe one day we'll expand it, but for now we want to narrow it. Because when I am working with one of my, my teammates, there's one question I ask. Was that person a 99% perfect fit for what we do? And if they weren't, then we move them off. We only want to deal with those that are 99% perfect fit. Because what our business is ultimately going for is not sales. We're going for testimonials. The more testimonials that we can get, the better we are on getting more and more lobsters. I'm showing a lobster, another lobster and saying, hey, your friend is over here and they're all coming together. When you sell to everyone, you ultimately are selling to no one. Your message is lost. Like the woman who told me she serves women from the ages of 18 to 78 who want a better life. There's nobody that's gonna be raising up their hand and be like, oh, that is me. No, instead what the conversation is like, yeah, so what? Yeah, okay, um, and what else? And what else? I want you to have such a clear and narrow market. Think of Airbnb, who was not going after anybody to disrupt the hotel industry. At first, they were only talking to those that are willing to sit on air mattresses. Facebook was only talking to Harvard students. Um, you know, Whole Foods was only talking to those who cared more about organic offerings than grocery bills. You want to be able to talk specifically to somebody. So like, that's me, right? I know that there's a bunch of people in the room, but that is me. One of the ways you can do this is really look at the underserved market. Who is being forgotten or who needs help the most? And why aren't they able to do this themselves? When we serve the underserved market, right? They, we end up helping them in such bigger ways. This is part of the reason why I became an entrepreneur. I could have continued working for companies like American Express and Xerox and all of those other big Fortune 500 companies. But I felt like I wasn't impacting the world enough. Whereas when I became an entrepreneur, when I decided that I was going to help you, you as the business owner, you as the one who has the big dreams for what your business could be, and the only thing stopping you was getting clarity, was being able to have those conversations with those ideal clients, I said, that's who I want to serve. Because sometimes when you, what you don't know you need is the thing that you need the most. So we educate and we help. And you are likely doing the same thing. You're educating people. You're helping them. Why aren't they able to do it themselves? And when you are able to serve them, when you're able to provide them some solution, we're not going to talk about the what just yet. We'll get to the what, I promise. When you're able to say what, how, like, you know, that you're going to be able to help them. Now things start to develop. And this becomes a mindset of abundance because the differences are, is that we're not just going after helping you save time, money, and energy. That is the people that are ultimately selling their prices and services as, or sorry, they're selling their services and products at low prices. Let me help you save. Let me help you save. That's Walmart's thing. Let me help you save money. And who does Walmart attract, right? Like, let's be honest here, right? You know, we, we've all seen the, the shopping at Walmart photos, right? We, we know the type of personality that, you know, yes, a lot of us do. I shop at Walmart. Would I say I'm a Walmart's ideal customer? Absolutely not, right? I go to Walmart for a very specific purpose. When we look at the premium side of it, right? We're like, yes, now not only are we able to help you save, but you're now going to reinvest that savings into growth and abundance. That is a wonderful place to be. 
This is how we become the catalyst of people's dreams and goals. And that is where I want all of you to be because when you can help someone to achieve more, they're willing to pay you more for that dream. Part of your demographics that you will likely want to, to underline or, or uh, you clarify um, are all of these things, right? Maybe you're going after a very specific age, right? Maybe you're going after a very specific gender. There could be marital or family status, right? We're going after family people. We're going after divorcees. We're looking at empty nesters, right? Is there a specific location? Um, and, and location is actually really valuable, even though we're all online, uh, when you are growing your business, because the, the likeliness of you focusing specifically on a geography helps you to spread that word of mouth a lot faster. Facebook was an online platform and they could have easily gone to everyone, but they started with a very specific location at first, Harvard campus only. We are only focusing on this 20 mile radius and that is it, right? We'll start here, we'll go 10 miles this way, 10 miles this way, 10 miles this way, 10 miles this way. And you have to have an at harvard.edu uh, domain name in order to sign up. If you don't have it, you're not our ideal client. Um, location or occupation, maybe an income, maybe we're looking for those that are most affluent, maybe we're looking for those that are most struggling, right? Um, is there an education level? The biggest two things in here that I really want you to focus on though, is the goals and aspirations of somebody. That is actually a really good filter out to figure out if this person is going to resonate with our message. In our company, we do this a lot. One of the first questions that we will ask every single prospect that comes through our, our doors is, what do you want most in life? What is your goal? And very quickly, depending on what their goal is, we will then determine that this person is a 99% fit or a no. If they're not 99%, if their goal is too small, we actually don't really want to help them because we as service providers need to feel inspired to help that person. I don't want to feel mediocre on helping somebody get to what I consider to be a mediocre goal. And this isn't a, uh, a slight on anybody's goals. There's lots of service providers out there that will help you with those things. We're focused on those that want to see themselves and already do see themselves as the cream of the crop, the top echelon. And we know that when we serve the lobsters of our groups, we will attract more lobsters. We will help those ultimately getting us more testimonials, more, more conversations, more, more love for what we do and how we do it. The other thing we want to focus on are fears. Fear is a, the number one uh, way that people will choose to be motivated in order to take action. Robert Cialdini talked about this in the book Influence. Now, this is, a, you know, as a political commentary, this is actually really interesting because right now, if you watch um, American politics, what you're going to see is that there's two candidates that are focusing on each one of these messages. There's one that is very fear based and sometimes they actually, let's be honest, sometimes both candidates will flip on both sides of this. So I don't want to isolate one versus the other. But this is often a very big conversation that we see in politics, where usually a candidate will talk about the fear. Look at how bad it could be. This is what um, what it will look like, right? Uh, you don't know what's going to happen, right? You um, you know what would happen if you don't if you're not able to work any further, and this is fear. <gasps> I, I need to work. I can't be out of a job anymore. I'm, I'm scared. I'm, you know, I, I don't want that type of conversation. I don't want somebody doing that for me. I don't want that. And so by, by focusing people on what they don't want, it's actually, it's actually the number one motivator. The second motivator is actually on the, the building up. And yes, it's not as powerful as fear. Fear is a very powerful way to get people to act. Um, but goals and aspirations is actually the second one, but it feels better. Let's be honest, it feels better. Nobody wants to be the fear monger all the time. And when I used to take sales back at Xerox and American Express, we were taught to build FUD, F-U-D, fear, uncertainty and doubt. And that was how we were taught, right? Build fear, build uncertainty, build doubt. And you do that again and again and again. That's defense lawyer stuff, right? That is their job. Their job is to build uncertainty and doubt so that the plaintiff can eventually get acquitted from whatever crime they've been accused of doing. Whereas goals and aspirations are, oh, 
they feel good. You're like, I want that. Instead of focusing on, I don't want that, I want that. Oh, that would feel good. And you, you get to a place as a service provider, you feel so much better for helping somebody to achieve more in their life. But get clear on what that is. I do not want you to tell me that your client's goals and aspirations are that they want more, that they want to feel better, that they, they want to feel like they have purpose. No, drive into that very specifically. If I walk to any one of you and I say, do you want to feel like you have purpose in life? Every single one of you is going to say, yeah, I, like who doesn't? There is not a single human being in this world that doesn't want to feel like they have purpose. What we do want to go after is those that have a very specific goal or a very specific aspiration, because then when I say that to you, listen, is your goal to ultimately live on a abandoned island? Not everybody's going to have that goal. A lot of people are going to be, eh, no, I'm cool. Like, I don't want to live on an abandoned island. Whereas maybe one in 10 of you is like, that sounds like a dream to me. Like, I would love to have like nobody else around. And now that I have that goal for you, we can have a better conversation than me trying to have a multiple different conversations with every single person. Okay. So a company that did this wrong, okay, let's talk about Kodak for a second, because Kodak has actually been a lot around for like a long time, I think like 100 years, I'm not too sure. Um, but what, what Kodak was really known for was, um, there was back in the 70s, there was actually two companies that owned more patents than anyone else. Uh, one of them was Xerox, um, and the other one was Kodak. And actually, in, in Rochester, New York, um, the, the Xerox Research and Development Center and the Kodak Re, uh, Research and Development Center share the same zip code. The, they both have their development centers right across the street from each other. And they kind of do a lot of crisscross, right? They built, spent so much money on R&D. Um, very cool places to ever go to, right? Um, I spent some time at the, the Xerox Research and Development Center. But Kodak, um, what very few people know, Kodak was actually the first company that created the first digital camera, right? They're like, look at this machine, isn't this cool, right? And they built this, this digital camera. And Kodak said, mm-hmm, that's interesting. And they swept it under the rug because nobody thinks of Kodak and digital cameras. We think of digital cameras being Canon and Sony and um, Pentax and all of these other companies. Nobody thinks of Kodak. Now, what ended up happening was Kodak hit their peak in revenue in 1996, right? Like right around that kind of dot com boom ish, right? Um, they had revenues of 16 billion dollars. We're not talking evaluation, we're talking revenue of 16 billion dollars. They were a juggernaut. Like they were considered to be like, wow, nothing is going to take down Kodak. But well, we also said the same thing about Blockbuster and a whole bunch of other companies, but we'll get to that in a second. Um, 1996, they had revenues of $16 billion. And in 2001, right when the dot-com boom and bust was happening, they had bought out a company called Ophoto. And what Ophoto was, was a picture sharing app. So when you would go ahead and uh, uh, you would get, develop your canister of film, Right. For those of us who are old enough to remember, we put it in the envelope, you would get it developed and three to five days later, we would come back and we would pick up our photos. And, and around the 2000s, the late 90s, the 2000s, not only would they give you your stack of, um, of photos, they would ask you, oftentimes it was an upsell, do you want the digital version of these photos? And almost every single person was like, yeah, absolutely, I'd want this. And they would print you off a CD. And you would take this CD and you would put it on your computer and it would automatically upload it to this, this now new website called Ophoto. And the intention that Kodak thought was Ophoto was that you would share these photos so that grandma could go online and be like, oh my goodness, that's my grandkids. That's amazing. And they would print off, um, they would print off their own little photos for themselves. So why, why if Kodak originally owned Ophoto, Right. And we'll, we'll talk about like picture sharing app. Right. Who do you know is the picture sharing app? Why only 10 years later were they almost a third? They dropped their valuation by two thirds. Like think about your own company. If you were only making one third of what you were making, would you survive? 
And despite the fact that the like Kodak is now still at six billion dollars, to go from sixteen billion dollars to um, to six billion in fifteen years is a significant draw, right? You're you're losing money. You're bleeding money every single day now. I put a question on there and I want you to answer. When you think of, there there was the old commercials of what is a Kodak moment. When you think of what is a Kodak moment, what do you think a Kodak moment is to you? Because for a long time, Kodak used to have that as their tagline on the commercials. And they'd be like, this is a Kodak moment. It's a Kodak moment. And you're like, yeah, you know, it's a Kodak moment. And for those of you that are old enough to remember the commercials, to even know who Kodak is as a company, what do you consider to be a Kodak moment. And I'm going to give you guys a second here just to kind of write it in there, but I'm going to tell you what ends up happening a year. One year after Kodak had revenues of $6 billion, they filed for bankruptcy. They went from the top of the top to being worth less than literally the paper they were printing photos on. They weren't even worth the photos that were on there. Yet, and this is where I really want you to capture this, Instagram was only 18 months old and they were bought for a billion dollars by, by Facebook. What is Instagram when you think about it? If you had to simply tell me what Instagram is, Tracy says an instant camera experience was my Kodak moment. Yeah, and the instant camera, yes. I remember we had like the, uh, the instant cameras, yes. For most of us, like when we think of Instagram, we think of it as a photo sharing app, right? It is to share experiences. We tag people, we comment on it. So why if Ophoto existed or Kodak owned Ophoto 11 years before that, were they not capturing that? Now, has anybody, like, does anyone even use Ophoto anymore? Like, I don't even know if we, we even know what that is. I remember the website. I don't use it anymore. I never understood it because Kodak got stuck in thinking that what a Kodak moment is, is a photo. Whereas most of us think that that is a Kodak moment. It's a memory worth cherishing. It's a memory worth sharing. It's something that we want to remember, right? And we can do that now with technology. I mean, Facebook does this and Google does this. I get reminders on my phone. Hey, look at where you were four years ago. And you're like, oh, did I need to have it printed off to be able to remember? No. Whereas, whereas that's the value of what it is. Kodak thought that a Kodak moment meant a physical picture. And they doubled down on the film industry, the film industry, the film industry. And as people moved away from having physical to actually digital, Kodak was trying to change the who, right? They tried to change that conversation, ultimately allowing themselves to become bankrupt. Now the story continues on because um, this year, Kodak was, uh, Kodak is now a pharmaceutical company. They, uh, right after COVID, they were awarded, I think, a giant loan of $400 million um, from the current um, U.S. administration to be able to create, uh, hopefully, a COVID relief. We'll find out. Um, so it's not about what your solution is, but what it does. Kodak got stuck in the is. They got stuck in the paper, whereas it's not about the paper. It's about remembering things. What it does is it helps us remember. Bookkeepers get stuck in this. They get stuck in, well, we're just doing bookkeeping services. Whereas what it does is it gives a business owner peace of mind, cash flow predictability, the ability to be able to manage the expenses and the income as it's coming through because a, a good bookkeeper will help you predict the trends. Listen, after doing your bookkeeping for the last three years, what I can tell you is that you actually do have seasonality. Oh, I thought I did, but now that you've proved it to me, now I can see that, right? We're sales training. It's not about sales training. It's about giving you empowerment to know that you can now have these conversations. We received a wonderful email from one of our current students um, just yesterday who told us that he closed a deal bigger than he had ever imagined. He's like, this deal was equal to my last year's entire revenue. And I couldn't have done it without you. It's not about what it is. 
It's about what it does. And for this gentleman, it was about being able to move his business into higher levels and expectations than he could have ever imagined. So for you new business owners specifically, what I am recommending to you right now is to stop. Stop spending money, right? Okay, Kim, like that's easy. No, no, but what I want to really like, I want you to take a look at your business accounts. I want you to take a look at what you're spending money on. Most of you are probably spending your money on websites, on logos, on the uh, Facebook ads. I was chatting with one woman. She hadn't even generated a dollar, a dollar of revenue. And she was already talking about spending money on Facebook ads. And I said, well, that's all great and dandy. But where is the money coming from? Oh, I, um, well, I guess I'm just going to pay for it, right? Okay, but, but that's great. But like, like, why? Like, why is your company not paying for the Facebook ads that your company is going to use? Why are you as a private citizen supporting a completely separate entity? You wouldn't go ahead and say, I want to help that other business that should be generating on its own. You, you are technically, this is why we create things called arm's length, right? You are technically a private citizen, right? Working for a business, right? And if the business isn't paying for you, I don't know any business around that has been able to convince their employees to work for them for free. And yet somehow we assume that because we're a business owner, we are volunteering our time. We are giving away our money to be able to do this. I want you to stop that immediately. Because if your business is truly as amazing as it is, it should be able to generate money. Okay, stop creating content. And I don't mean to stop creating content forever, but at least in the first 30, 60 days while you're trying to generate revenue. I see too many people that focus so much on their marketing efforts without figuring out their sales efforts. And the problem with figuring out your marketing efforts is a marketing conversation is typically a one to 100 conversation. I am talking to 100 people and I'm hoping to get one or two of them to eventually buy. Whereas a sales conversation is a one to one conversation. I am talking specifically to you and I'm hoping that you will buy. And when you do, I can then go back and say, okay, where did we change that conversation? When did I get that person to say, yes, that is me. And then we can start to build upon on top of that. That's actually where valuable content truly comes through. Whereas when we start creating content before we have a paying clients, we just throw crap in the air and hope that something like this resonates with someone who I'm hoping will be my client. Have a specific conversation with a specific person, take that conversation and create content out of it, as opposed to saying, hey, in general, we think that this might be a problem that some people might have. That's the same as throwing out the giant ocean net. And then stop going halfway. Stop trying something, oh, that didn't work, and then moving back. Oh, I'm going to try this. Oh, that didn't work. And I'm going to move back. If you're going to do it, go all the way. And if your business is a legitimate business, I actually wrote this in one of my Facebook rants not too long ago. I said, the only thing that makes a business legitimate is not a website. One woman was chatting. I was chatting with, she was like, well, I need a website. And I said, why? And she goes, well, because then I'm a legitimate business. And I said, if, if all it took was a website to make you a legitimate business, Every scammer out there would technically have a legitimate business because they all have websites. I said, what really makes you a legitimate business is being able to generate income, being able to generate revenue. That makes you a legitimate business. Instead, instead invest in skills. Help yourself as a business owner. Look at where you want to be, not just where you are today as solopreneur, where do you want to be in two years or three years time? In our company, one of the things I do is I have our org chart created and I have our org chart created for where we are when we're three times the size. And I imagine what that will look like because what that gives me is a roadmap to say, here's some of the skills that we're going to need. Here's some of the tasks that we're likely going to have. And it helps us to clarify in that. If you're investing in skills, ask yourself, what will your business need in a year, two years, or three years from now? And what skill set do you need in order to be able to get there? Now, I am biased, but I will promise you that the one skill that every single business needs 
is someone who knows how to sell. And if it's not going to be you, then who is it going to be? Yesterday, I did a great presentation with um, Inc. Magazine, and we talked about how to know when it's the right time to hire. And one of the big things that I came back to is even if you're in a situation where you want to hire salespeople, you better have the skill set to know that you're going to be able to hire that person. And in the event they leave, you can pick up the pieces where they go. Instead, instead meet with prospects. Don't be putting out content hoping that someone is going to read it. Have a conversation with someone. And I promise you, the more conversations, the more relationships you develop, you are going to help yourself even further. I was chatting with a client this morning and I said, you are, you are going to have far more people in your life that are going to not be your client than are going to be your clients. But if you build that relationship first, even those who will never be your clients can still support you and cheer you on and recommend you. And instead, go big. Go big. If you're going to do this, do it. Right? Joe Namath, who is um, a, a giant NFL coach, he says, if you aren't going to go all the way, why go at all? If you are serious about growing your business, if you are serious about making 2021 the year that you pay, hit 100,000, 250, 500,000, a million dollars, $10 million, figure out what you need to do to get to that $1 million by the end of next year and start to reverse yourself and be serious with yourself. What do you need to invest in? Okay, so your first steps, here's your homework assignments. What skills are gonna help you make more money? List 10 companies or people that you personally wanna help. And don't forget to attend the next webinar. Change is going to be your only constant. Oh, sorry, that's the, um, those are the dates for the business link one. But if you want to get fast results, um, we, have, we have 10 people on the line. So you, almost every single person on here can get this. But if you really want to get the fast results, if you are determined to make this happen before the end of 2020, I want you to book a meeting with us. Bits.ly slash KO meeting. <sighs> Why do we do this? Because we truly believe that you can have everything you want in life when you help enough people get what they want. I consider Zig Ziglar to be the most influential sales leader that I can ever follow. And if you want to know my why, why do I do this is because business owners like you. I love teaching. I love traveling. I love working with my family. I, we are also, um, our company also gives 1% 1, 1 of our profits back to the Nature Conservancy of Canada. They, they use that money to buy private land and turn it into conservation sites. I want to help you have whatever your dream is. This is me. Thank you so much for, for attending today. We are a KO Advantage Group. We are the only subscription-based sales training company available out there. We have tier plans from everything from teams to individuals to small business owners just like yourself. We allow you to join and take the training that you need, learn the skill sets that you need, and leave whenever you're ready. We're going to help you connect with more clients and get those premium services. That's it for everybody. If you're, if you have not taken advantage of the um, of today's meeting link, I encourage you, I encourage you to at least take a look at our get the slide deck for all the information that you need, so that we can help you sell even more faster. I'd love to hear from you as, as you're leaving in the chat today. What is one thing that you're going to take away? And I look forward to seeing you on our next webinar. Bye bye for now.